everyone, and, and happy President's Day. And welcome to the first installment of Jerry Van Weingarten's uh, courses on the polar regions of the Earth. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, Jerry is a longtime HASP member and serial presenter on the topic of geography, which we all appreciate very much. Uh, Jerry holds a BA from Calvin University, an MA from the University of Minnesota in geography, an MA from the University of Michigan in education, and a specialist certificate in administration from MSU. He has been a K through 12 teacher, the superintendent of Hamilton Community Schools, and a part-time geography instructor at Hope College, Muskegon Community College, Davenport University, Grand Valley State University, and Calvin University. And, and what it doesn't say on here, he has also been president of HASP at some point. So without further ado, Jerry, we'll turn it over to you. Am I on now? Okay. Well, thank you, Kim. And I'll try to live up to all that, what you said, which may be a little bit difficult. By the way, you have a quiz in front of you and you know the rules, don't you? No cheating at all. The only, and, but my definition of cheating, if you haven't heard it before, is if you fail to consult with your neighbor, then you are cheating that person out of your superior knowledge. So does that work? Yeah. All right, well, let's proceed with the ocean floor. Uh, it warmed up out here, otherwise the, the atmosphere was just about right last week for this kind of talk. So let's see what's what we've got here. Thank you, Kim, for getting me going here. So we'll go from there. By the way, if you have a question by, or really a statement of any kind that you would like to make, be free, feel free to uh, interrupt me and make the statement, whatever. And that is also true for those who are on Zoom, that they can contact Susan and make sure that we hear your question, okay? Well, the Arctic floor, the uh, map gets you started and you have a couple of ridges there that we will, we will be referring to. And um, somehow or other, they have names that seem like they're difficult to pronounce. And I may have to uh, struggle with a few of those, but if you look at the name, maybe you can see it. Uh, well, <clears throat> For instance, oops, I'm, excuse me, I'm not sure whether I'm doing this right or not. Yeah, uh, the Lomonosov Ridge is going to be talked about quite a bit, and so is the Geiko Ridge. So if those two particularly you keep in mind would be helpful. Uh, well, the Arctic region. There's something called the Arctic Council. We'll start with that. <clears throat> the, this shows you that there was a meeting at Ilsat in Greenland, which is on the ice ford. The, it was created the Arctic Council and committed to legal framework orderly settlement of overlapping claims, which is a big issue, safety, research, and environmental monitoring. And there you have a list of the participants in the Arctic Council. You also have other people or other countries, and maybe people too, because the uh, indigenous people also have a say in this. And that shows up in uh, the, uh, larger group, but notice where they, they're in this particular town. Zelizig Umagan is in Greenland. 
That may not be the pronounce, correct pronunciation, but it's somewhat close anyway. But look at that nice little place where you could meet if you like. Be kind of hanging on the edges of the shore of Greenland. And notice that once again, you see buildings on poles, and that's going to be true in many cases. It's because uh, either the snow is too deep or the permafrost is present, and that comes up again and again. So that's what it looks like when you're actually there for that particular meeting. This is a Opportunity to serve you. Where did that come from? I do not know. Okay. Now, the Arctic Council here is meeting in Icolet, which is in Nunavut. And that, of course, is part of Canada. And that will show up here in a moment. Eight members of this council meet there. Uh, seven have indigenous communities that are represented as well. So environmental protection is uh, one of their big issues. They wanna make sure that people who um, are involved with the Arctic region, so they need to somehow control the use of oil and gas kinds of uh, ex explorations as they constantly are going along in the upper uh, under the ocean. There's a lot of oil, oil there, so they, there's always seems to be a fight for that. And of course, they want to protect the environment as well. So that's part of this council. Good morning, David. Let me go to back. Have hmm. Yes, it's Marsha Buck. Hello, Ms. Marsha Buck. Yeah. May I have one? Password. Password for some, someone, uh, Delta? someone is not muted uh, there. Excuse me, whatever. If you're on, Zoom, please be on mute because it is coming through in the into the classroom and making us stop short. Okay, all right. So you had those 12. Um, countries, but all of these are added to it as observers and they all want to be part of it, what's going on in the Arctic because it is a rich region as far as resources are concerned. So here we have a, the location in Nunavut of the Aikulet meeting place. It has a pretty decent building or two where they can meet. This is one of them. this happens to be the church uh, that is located there. You'd think way in this northern part, oh, are they building neat buildings or aren't they? And it certainly seems like this is a good one. And so is this. Uh, the legislative building is here and it's part of the places where the council will meet. But <clears throat> that's not the only place they meet. They will meet elsewhere as well. So we'll start off with this particular meeting. It's way back, uh, happens to be this one in Portland, Maine. So they don't always meet in the Arctic region. John Kerry happens to be leading this one. And we're talking about October 7, 2016, when they were organizing this particular council meeting. And it shifts from one place to another as we go along. So the assembly this time is being held in Reykjavik in Iceland. So that one is also in 2016. 2,000 participants from 50 countries came to meet to talk about what's going on in the Arctic region. It's quite a big area for um, quite a lot of people who are interested, of course, in the Arctic. And they 
seem to be very concerned about climate, all these participants. That is the building in Reykjavik. It's a beautiful building. It happens to be the Harpo Marco Neumannberger Concert Hall. So uh, they use that as their meeting place as well. Hmm. This is where they had their 12th council, the 12th council. And now they're ready to go into their 13th council uh, next year, but it has not been assigned yet. Well, it has been assigned to Russia to lead it, but that has not been mentioned as to where it's supposed to meet. But a little idea of it, these are some of the flags of the members. Yeah. Whenever they meet together, they, of course, represent their own countries. And a picture of the group of 12 members at this particular 12th Kent, the council meeting. So now they have switched it over to Russia and it is being given here to Sergei Lavrov. Who accepts, the, who accepts the leadership for the 13th Arctic Council from Ireland. And he has not announced yet where this is going to be. But at least the better, the hammer has been passed to the next one. Okay, to looking at this map, <clears throat> a little red line under Svalbard is uh, going to be mentioned a couple different times. So at least you know where it's at. And if you take a look at the uh, total area, once again, how close is it to Greenland or to Europe, that is fin Finland and Sweden, and Norway? Well, it seems to be a sort of a jumping off point for people who wanna to go to the North Pole. At this particular place, Keo Hendrickson is the name of this station, and this station is a research station. It's studying the atmosphere. It happens to be located at 70 degrees north. The studies affect, the, they are studying the effects of the upper atmosphere, the chemistry on the ozone, and the destruction, and the timing of the next aurora. aurora displays. So this is just one of the many research stations that are parked around the Arctic Circle. So that's just one of them. And just an example of the Aurora Borealis happens to be a picture out from Greenland. All right. Now we get back to the Lamarosa Ridge. <clears throat> which we will be talking about somewhat. And notice where it is. If you can see it on your map, that's fine. But if you can't, look, at least you can see it here. And uh, it was named after Mikhail Lomorosov, who happens to have a university in Moscow named after him. So here's a picture of him giving his nice little lecture to Catherine II on very scientific facts and the like. So um, that's where that name comes from and it keeps coming up again because he was honored with that ridge. If you look at this picture, kind of gets, gets a, a little idea as to the low points and the high points on it. And uh, once again, if you look on the top, you can see where the, it starts here at about uh, 3,500 meters below sea level. And the, the top part still doesn't reach, reach the surface, of course, at all at 1,500 meters below sea level. Uh, part of the whole situation up there, a good picture of how this looks. And here you have the Gecko Ridge and the Lomonosov Ridge compared. And that should give you a pretty good picture as to how deep this is. And if you look along the side, it's all uh, the depths are in meters. 
So it's a fairly deep ocean that the uh, Arctic Ocean is. <clears throat> so the ridge crest for the Lomonosov Ridge is still 3,200 feet below sea level. So it's quite a ways down. The base, basin depth is about 6,000 to 11,000 feet below sea level. So it's a pretty deep ocean in spite of the fact that it is smaller than most of the oceans of the world. Once again, just pointing out a couple places. If you look at the green one, uh, there are two major basins. Number one is the Amerasian Basin. It's called that, closest to the Americas. And the other one is the Eurasian, Eurasian Basin, number two. And then it also identifies the two major ridges that we've been talking about. So going from there, we'll take a look at this one continuous ridge. <clears throat> and it, <coughs> excuse me, the ridge is 550,000 miles long. Well, obviously, that not here in this ocean it can't be, but it is part of the 50,000 ridge that surrounds the entire globe. And let's look at that for just a moment to see where that goes, but at least it's up here in the Arctic as well. If you look at the ridges in the world, this is where they are, and the one that we really are looking at, of course, is the Mid Atlantic Ridge, which goes right on up into. Uh, into the Arctic Ocean. But it in fact does, if you look, it does in a way connect with the one that goes on the other side, the Juan de Fuca Ridge, which is out there by Seattle and on down into the Pacific and joins up on the other side. So this is just part of that big ridge. That's why it can be 50,000 miles long. <clears throat> well, the ridge really is a split in many ways, it is separating all the time. Okay, let's look at that Mid-Atlantic Ridge where it starts and stops. Uh, well, it doesn't stop, it just keeps on going. And take a look at, it goes through the Azores and uh, starts in the Southern part of the Ascension Islands. So it goes right on up through the, the whole place. Okay, and eventually it gets up here into Iceland. Well, it's worth looking at that ridge just a little bit to see what's, what's happening in the Arctic because this ridge is constantly splitting and separating. <clears throat> now, before the continents separated themselves at this particular point, you can see where that ridge was as it was between the Mm -hmm. a little, oh, is it working? Yeah, there it goes. Uh, between the continents as it meanders up beyond Greenland and so forth. All right. Well, what does that ridge really look like? <clears throat> if you look at the center, uh, the center block here, you can tell that this is the ridge that is. Uh, being used. It is splitting apart. It's not coming together like this one or sliding. It is coming apart. And that's what happens down here in this particular ridge. Now that separation concur, continues all the time and estimated at a rate of two, two meters per year. That it is, so it's hardly noticeable, obviously. Well, it does affect uh, the whole area, that's for sure. <clears throat> Let me get you a little feel as to the magnetism that occurs at this ridge. If you look at the ridge, it is, of course, the magnet is to the North Pole at this particular time. But 78 million years ago, it was headed toward the South Pole. And if you look at the ridges that are available here, you can see that 
uh, the black area here is the present North North Pole Ridge, the magnetic, magnetic uh, pushes toward the north. But if you're the, the first white one here on either side, on both sides, it would be oriented toward the South Pole. And then if you look at the rest of the um, feelings here, on over throughout the millions and millions of years as to it goes back and forth. I think we're a long ways yet from it going south, so I don't think we have to worry about it. Right now, it's still the North Pole. Okay. Again, to look at the amount of movement that occurs here, it's alternating between North and South over the many, many years. Now, let's take this ridge and go straight through Iceland. That's where the ridge happens to go, and it is a very active one. And of course, you have uh, volcanoes pushing out there every so often from Iceland. And the growth of new islands as well. Here's one that is, has grown in the last years. In 1963, it finally appeared before the surface. And it tends to keep on growing. And this is right near Iceland itself, just south of Iceland. So it's part of that same ridge that keeps on pushing the, uh, yeah, and splitting. If you look at this picture, you we see that in 1967, it was below the surface of the sea, but it was about that big and it, moved on to its present up here. But otherwise, over the years, it, it gradually shrunk enough to get up into the above the uh, water level, above sea level. So Circe is nicely above at this particular point. And then, and if we look at sort of a drawing of what might have, what probably happened, and it's pretty good growing of how Circe tended to erupt. It eventually got above the water level, and then it uh, shows up this way, and has been doing that for the last, oh, maybe 30 years or so, 40 years. Circe was, in 67, one square mile, and then it reduced itself to about a half square mile in 2002, but it is still there. So that little island. Once again, we look at our total area in the Arctic and it's nicely pictured where the European basin is, where the Canadian basin is. So, and the two major ridge, ridge, ridges. One of the research er institutions happens to be the Woods Hole or Oceanographic Institution. And they have used their robots to make travel from uh, Svalbard all the way up to, in this place, Point Barrow to the Alaska, all the way from the, almost the Russian area, all the way up to Point Barrow and in their studies of this whole thing. And so some of this, much of this information keeps from, keeps coming from them. Just to get a little feel for this, uh, this diagram uh, picture shows the, the idea that there's a co continental ridge. Okay, that's fine. And then the slope that really descends very fast. The continental shelf is important as far as property is concerned. Each country has, uh, would like to have that continental ridge be a part of their, their country and they keep other people off, especially if there are fishing rights and the like. So uh, once they get to the continental slope, well, then it's free to any country that would like to use it, so. Once again, 
we're back to that Arctic floor. It's seeing um, the various ridges that we mentioned before. Now, another picture of this shows you that there are active volcanoes on the Arctic floor. And here are five of them. So you get a little feel for it. And notice the two ridges are very prominent in it. And we'll look at each of those two ridges in a moment about uh, what's happening in as far as volcanic activity is concerned. Uh, the Geiko Ridge extends from the Eurasian Basin to Leptiev Sea of Siberia. Okay. Its deepest ridge, it's the deepest ridge on the planet. So it is very, one of the very deep ones, obviously. Its spread is slow compared to the other rifts. Much of it is three miles below the ice cover. In 2001, aerobatic submarines explored this ridge. Part of the 40,000 mile continuous chain of volcanic seafloor mountains, they are extensions of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which we just said, and they are split between two tectonic plates. They're located on very thin crust. In 1999, they had a volcanic eruption as big as the one in Pompeii with pyroclastic flows. Now, look at that a little bit further. And of course, Pompeii was a big uh, explosion in Italy. Pyroclastic flows. We'll look at that in a moment. The Arctic Ocean has two deep water basins, the Eurasia and the Amer Amerasia. This picture uh, was taken uh, when the last volcanic eruption occurred near Tonga in, in the Pacific. And I use this because it's hard to get any kind of picture underneath the water in the Arctic. So, but it did show up here and you will see in this one spot here where they'd see the evidence of the explosion blowing up into that area in the Pacific. So if these volcanoes in the Arctic explode and, and really push up, well, they probably make some kind of a stir in the water that looks like this. The Geico Ridge is a huge gash in the Earth crust. Intensive seismic activity began in January 1999 and continued for seven months. 18 Arctic basins, basin earthquakes were hydroacoustically detected during the 64 days. In 2001, two previously undiscovered volcanoes were, were discovered in the ridge. In 2007, Woods Hole saw evidence of explosive, explosive volcanic eruptions. As more area under the melting ice sheet, more methane escapes, adding to more warming of the planet. And we'll see methane coming through here again and again. Here's the Gacko Ridge. That is a nice block picture of it anyway. So uh, il illustrating what it kind of looks like. And you will see that it, it does have some ridges in it. And there's some explosive material that is coming out of the ridge every so often. Well, when, <clears throat> when this thing was exploding, there was enough um, activity that it lowered some of the smaller islands into because of the rising sea level in, that, in the area. And here we have six major islands in the Gacko Ridge. 900 are smaller islands in the Gacko Ridge. 
in 2016, reported five of the small Solomon Islands disappeared into the water. The Solomon Islands are once more in the Pacific. <clears throat> so the changing of the whole Earth's surface is, well, it's all tied together. And this is part of it. On one spot in the Geico Ridge, uh, they will find sea sponges. There is some life in this thing yet. So, um, and sea sponges and starfish. And what they're doing is they are feeding on 300 year old, um, well, they are 300 year old sea sponges. They're feeding on fossilized worms on top of the Gecko Ridge. These fossilized worms uh, evidently have, uh, they're fossilized, so they have a crust around them, but they can evidently get some food out of the worm, at the center of the crust of the worm. So this is still some feeding going on from ancient times today. <clears throat> Methane released is linked to seismic activity, obviously. It is observed near the surface of the Arctic Ocean. Here's one big blowout, but it's on land in Siberia. The Siberian crater was, not, was uh, noticed, noticed not too long ago, uh, in the last uh, 40 years or so, but it really blows the uh, area out. It's a methane kind of explanation that uh, explosion that occurs. And that's not the only place. You have to find another one here in that same area. The methane explodes almost like a volcano, but it isn't because it just pushes the methane gas out and causes a crater. <clears throat> uh -huh. If it goes, if it's blowing up under water, it may show up like this, these bubbles, these bubbles come about. So uh, the methane continues to add much more to the air and uh, obviously it is a big contributor to global warming. Another kind of picture that is drawn to show what happens is that the carbon dioxide and helium, methane, these trace metals are rising from the craters themselves into the water. And then of course, they surface into the air once it gets above the, the water line. This person is trying to measure how much carbon dioxide is coming out and methane on his particular peat bog. And, uh, you get a measure of. If you dig through the permafrost and you open the hole, the methane will come out. And this particular person set a match to it or made lit it as a bonfire and it will burn there for until they, it runs out of methane, but the methane will burn. <clears throat> some pictures as to what happens in the methane. Much of it is trapped beneath the permafrost. If you can see the, the permafrost area there, much of it's been parked out below of it. And eventually it may come to the surface. And when it comes to the surface, it may also push the, some of the land up along with it. So, Another picture showing that it's pretty active down below, but it comes through through the top as bubbles as methane. Well, <clears throat> let's look at some eruptions. 1999. One was as big as the one that Bill Byrne buried Pompeii. The Kako Ridge is a mountain chain from northern Siberia. Or and Greenland to Siberia. 20, 12 epicenters were determined out of 18 earthquakes that were recorded. 
and 12 new volcanoes were found 13,000 feet below the ocean surface. Flat top volcanoes came some 1.2 miles wide and hundreds of meters high were found to fill the ocean valley. These were found by sonar and visual images. Abundant hydrothermal activity stretches for 930 miles on that ridge. And, it, <clears throat> and a, a model of this is in here. As you can see, the magma comes out of one of the edges of it and ex goes uh, and is uh, deposited along part of the ridge in that way. Now, to look at that a little bit further, we're back to this picture, as you can see. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, did some more exploring. And in May 27, 2008, it explored the Arctic Ocean floor and noted that parts of the floor seethe with glacier, geysers. You think of Yellowstone, not Arctic Ocean. <clears throat> well, Woods Hole is a place in Massachusetts, and this is a picture of it, of the institution that does all this, um, what should I say, exploration back and forth. Well, the Arctic states are meeting in Greenland to discuss oil exploration since global warming is making the floor more accessible. 25% of the Earth's remaining oil is under the Arctic Ocean, 25%. <clears throat> Companies are already making claims to the oil under Arctic Ocean, under the Arctic floor. There's a Las Vegas uh, company that is based, has taken Arctic oil and gas as a, an important to, uh, venture, I guess. A US based company has laid claim to the potential vast areas of the Arctic floor. They estimate that there are 400 billion barrels of petroleum present. How they figure that, I'm not sure, but they, they evidently they have pretty good reason to figure that out. Here we have a ship breaker, Odin, it is called. It made a little trip. The trip is from Tomsa. No, uh, Norway, if you can see that over here, down here, and goes all the way up to the Gacko Ridge, as you can see, and eventually gets the, back to Svalbard. Well, the Swedish uh, icebreaker uh, was used by scientists from the Woods Hole Institute has its own helicopter, the crew of 15 first non-nuclear surface vessel to reach the North Pole in 1991. Well, okay, but here's another one. This one, um, well, this is another uh, picture of that same one. The icebreaker was built in 1899 and notice the front end of that because it can climb up over on the ice and uh, crush the ice and then keep on keep on going. It, it happens to hold 30 researchers from Lungurabin Svalbard in its, in its uh, rooms in the, on board. Let's take a look at some of these found this um, institution found the evidence of explosive volcanoes not possible, uh, un, not possibly under such intense weight and pressure of the ocean, 2.5 miles below the ice. So what's happening when they do explode? Well, once again, you see this particular map to so remember where they are picture of one of the volcanic eruptions and the Northern Lights happens to be from a picture in near uh, Greenland. They cover four square miles lying 
lying along the Yakko Ridge. This is part of the mid Atlantic Ridge system. The volcanoes located on the Yakko Ridge discovered by the institution. And notice where they are. And I want you to take a look at two particular places. One is the Jessica's Hills and the Duque Hill. And they're named after two people. And we'll see that they're on that ridge. Here are the two people. Two divers were, went too deep on the Gakko Ridge and died of pulmonary barter trauma. The two hills on the ridge are named in their honor. And that's what you just saw. And here are the two. Here's a picture of Stephen Duque and Lieutenant Jessica Hill. Active vents explored under great pressure. Pyroclastic deposits formed ridges. All right. Let's take a look at a pyroclastic deposit for just a moment. If you were on land, like the islands in the Caribbean and elsewhere, uh, if they have what they call a pyroclastic flow, <clears throat> which they call the nites or ardentes, it rushes down the mountain at a very fast speed. It's called the burning cloud. Pyroclastic flows usually are very, very fast of hot gas and rock, DEFRA, 1,830 degrees Fahrenheit. It is very hot. And it is moving at 450 miles an hour. So you don't want to hang around when one of these is ready to go. It destroyed uh, the little city of, uh, you know, and, uh, um, one of the Caribbean islands and buried the entire city some uh, 70, 80 years ago. What does a pyroclastic flow look like? Well, can't get one from underneath the water. So we took, to, took a picture of one that looks like this in the Philippines, not too long ago, kind of too, within the last year. But look at that flow coming down finally get, and it's coming awful fast. I wonder if that vehicle ever made it out of there because it moves. Well, the Arctic Yak Ridge eruption reveals magma from the Earth's mantle. A submarine equipped with scientific mapping tools passed over the ridge as magma was erupting in the ultra slow sp spread spreading rift. These volcanoes emit lobes and sheets of lava, much like Kilauea. Of course, that's in Ohio and um, the Hawaiian Islands, but not like Mount Vesuvius. So it's coming more like the gradual flow that comes out and not explosive. So they found some rock debris that precipitated out of the ocean water, okay? If it, was, <clears throat> if it flows like that of Kilauea, <clears throat> um, it would look like this underground and, and not like the Mount Vesuvius one. Pillow lava forms when this hot lava hits the cooler water and it kind of forms these things that look like pillows as a consequence. Then you get that picture. Uh, they call it pill lava. They went down and picked up a few of these with this piece of equipment off of Gackle Ridge. And that's what it looks like up close. Okay, this organization again observed hundreds of earthquakes over a nine month period. Experts doubt that these volcanoes affect the melting of the Arctic ice. Not necessarily, okay? 
However, carbon dioxide gas from the volcanoes contribute to greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. A little picture of uh, how it might look like, a diagram of it anyway, how the uh, spreading of the rift allows lava and the like to, to poke through the, to in, th the surface of the mantle into the ocean. And there we have <clears throat> something called black smokers. The black smokers, uh, we have a picture or two of those, are all along this particular ridge, as you can see in this area here. So, and it spills over on, uh, on the edge, the black smokers do. Okay. Let's look at a couple of them. These are actual pictures of them forming underneath the water and blowing, blowing out into the water themselves. And I guess that's what they, why they look like they're black, although they also have water, water uh, being released steam and so forth. So you have both of those kinds of things happening in the, on the floor. Here is one of the causes. Take a look at the spreading that occurs here, and then up comes the magma and explosion of a volcano. Again, another black smoker that was, you can get a little idea of it. And uh, the white smoker is, of course, steam that is coming up, that water that is collected down underneath the mantle. So as a consequence, obviously, the water rises through the vents themselves, and the cold water seeps down into the cracks near the, the ridge, which then, of course, travels over to where it can be released above the ridge. Again, seawater penetrates the seafloor in newly formed land. It reaches the hot lava. Temperatures reach 400 to 700 degrees Celsius. Chemicals <clears throat> exchange, fluid is injected into the vents. And then you get another picture that's real of that same kind of chimney that's occurring down underneath. Another picture of those vents and a black smoker. So at least we have a couple of pictures that look like what's that look at what's happening underneath. Once again, take a look at the lineup of the ocean water and the depth of the particular ridges. Okay. Now we get to some routes that they were able to form. And one of them in the, oops, on, on this side is uh, made it all the way to the Atlantic coast, starting out in the, the uh, Greenland area. They crushed through it all. And there's another one on the other side, as you can see on this side as well, that made it all the way through. So gradually, they are forming uh, routes that can go through the Arctic Ocean. Well, is it quiz time? You got it all made out? I'll give you the answers. <laughs> uh huh. Now, if you've matched these up, it's sort of supposed to follow what I've been talking about. The number one would be D as in dog. Number two 
is J is in jig. Number three is M, Mike. Number four is Oboe. Number five is Charlie. Number six is Adam or Abel. Number seven is King. Number eight is Nan. You're getting them all wrong. Oh, you are right. You are right. That's the worst I've ever done. <laughs> this, I pulled out the wrong one. That's Antarctica. Okay. Well, I can read it off of here. Let's start over. <laughs> Number one is dog. Number two is George. Three is jig. Now, are you doing better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, number four is how. Number five is love. Six is baker. Seven is Mike. Eight is Abel. Nine is oboe. Ten is Nan. Eleven is Charlie. Twelve is easy. 13 is king, and 14 is fox. Well, I'm sorry I put you through that. <laughs> there's a mistake. Okay. I think there's a little mistake. Okay. Uh, number four, no, three and four. See, Mid-Atlantic Rift, isn't that the 50,000 mile ridge? J instead of H? It could be. You could interchange those, I think. Okay, yeah. Sorry. However, I have made mistakes like this before. Oh, and uh, somebody will straighten me out, which is great. That's what, that's what it's for. By all means, do so. Okay. Well, anything that you want to say at this point? We'll move to the next one. Got another one? We'll try to follow, follow it down the line. <clears throat> so, Jared, yeah, go ahead. So when we look at these amazing depths and we hear about robotic uh, um, submarines that are taking pictures and doing research and yeah. that sort of thing, I'm wondering if anybody knows, I don't, how deep like nuclear submarines can go oh does anybody know that i do not know anybody got an idea they there's a <clears throat> certainly a problem of pressure on the vehicle isn't there and i don't know how far they can go can they According go all the way to, to the uh, go ahead google it's 300 meters Say that again, will you? According to Google, okay, a nuclear you. submarine can dive to a depth of about 300 meters. 300 meters, oh, okay. So, that not right? Okay, I do not know. Okay, are we ready to look at the next one? Utagavik is a little city up in the north of Alaska. It is pretty well built on permafrost. Everything that you see there is in, uh, has something to do with permafrost and they have problems with that all the time. If the sun shines too much on the, on the building, it may let the heat travel down to where it's setting. And then, of course, the building, some of them will tip sideways one way or another, depending on whether the melting is even or not. Well, they fight with this permafrost all the time. And of course, underneath it, you find quite a bit of methane. So let's look at this whole area a little bit. 
up in the corner of Alaska is Point Morrow. That's where this Utagavik is really the town of, of Barrow, and Barrow is a whole lot easier to pronounce. So it's the most northern city in the United States, 4,500 people, and it is an Eskimo community, community. So a picture of permafrost, the, at least one picture of it, there's all kinds of pictures of it, but notice how this piece of ice broke off and then you can readily see where that ice is underneath the cover of the soil that's above it and the sedge that is growing in, on, in above it. So quite a bit of quite a bit of thick ice at this particular picture anyway. Now underneath <clears throat> the permafrost doesn't necessarily um, allow everything to be down underneath. And so you find methane trying to push up various places uh, wherever the, <clears throat> the permafrost happens to be. <clears throat> so they'll, it'll push up and form little hills as far as that's concerned. So the methane is doing its job in this case. They're little pingo-like features. Here, the mounds are being covered with ice, again, in most of it, but notice how they've been pushed up. The soil has been pushed up. And here is a definite pingo, or two of them, and they can grow as high as 60 meters, anywhere from three to 60 meters high. So you find those along the tundra areas in the Arctic region. Well, Prudho Bay has its own Alaska pipe, pipeline way up on the top there. It is drilling oil all the time. And at this point, it is pumping it on down to a pipeline. They happens to be parked out in the, into the Arctic Ocean and digs down into the vein where the oil happens to be. Then they put it into this particular pipeline. That pipeline goes all the way from Fruit Hole Bay down to Valdez. Not too many years ago, we had an oil spill in Valdez when they didn't hit, when it wasn't captured appropriately. But that's a pretty interesting kind of pipeline that they have to have. The oil itself has to remain about a hundred and uh, I think it's 140 degrees warm in order to flow through that pipeline. So they've got to have a number of pipe pumping stations on the way down. And you would think that they would have a nice straight line, but that wouldn't work. They, uh, they cross one of the faults or several faults really, but this one is on the Denali fault. Notice that they curve it back and forth so that if there is a spreading, an earthquake, that it can easily be bent and moved a little bit so that it does not, so it does not break, break the flow. Well, this is what they look like. And on the top, they have some solar heaters which draw heat for, for, from the bottom of the permafrost so that the these pipes, these um, pipes that hold it up, not the big pipe, uh, can release heat into the air like this. So the top heaters, when the sun shines, and that's when, the, when they have a problem, when the sun doesn't shine, it's not a problem, but when it does, uh, it warms up the area too much and they have gotta get rid of that heat. And notice that the uh, heat is then extracted from the bottom of the pole so that uh, it does not sink any further into the permafrost. Valdez oil, oil terminal. Permafrost, yeah. 
at various possible stages of what it looks like underneath the permafrost itself, whether it's in a water area or whether it's uh, on the surface of the land. Permafrost is a big thing. For them. Here we have another ship <clears throat> that is looking into the uh, study of the entire, entire Arctic Ocean area. So this big diesel one is electric powered and it has a strong hull to cross the ice. And again, we see it, it drills cores in the middle of the ice flows. It has moon pools that allow a look down through the water and can launch underwater vehicles. It has, it is the home of about 120 people. The Haley Polar Stern is a cruise uh, research team vessel from Germany. Dr. Edmund found a monster hydrothermal plume about a thousand meters rising up from the ocean floor. The plume was a half a mile thick. And they, he decided he would, they decided to make a drawing of it because they have no pictures of it. This hydrothermal plume. Well, it had all the telltale chemical tra traits of major eruptions in other mid-ocean ridges. It found 20 areas of hydrothermal activity that dot 600 miles of the ridge, of the Gecko Ridge. The icebreaker really well reinforced to climb the ice and push it down. And there's a trail of the way it took off and it wound up all the way to the Emerson uh, Basin, Emerson Basin, okay. <clears throat> Some action as it tries to climb on the ice flows. Took this travel from Point Burrow out to Salbird and went right over the La Marossa Ridge. Again, another picture of it. It has two small uh, submersibles, which go down and look at what's going on down underneath, the puma and the jaguar. During the Cold, weather, Cold War, Soviets and US nuclear submarines traveled back and forth under the cap many times. And you can see that trail as it goes on. And once again from Tromso in Norway. Polar bears at the North Pole, yes. Look at the picture of the submarine that they are close to. So there are polar bears up there, okay? And well, what about the land that's underneath? Can we claim it? Well, the Russians did say, okay, we planted this titanium flag under the North Pole. And so we claim it, it's ours. All right. If you go a little bit further, that was already back in 2007. They, I think they still claim it as theirs. <clears throat> so if this cartoon represents anything at all, He's pushing a, his own flag up there <laughs> at the North Pole. And not everybody is terribly happy about that, including one very interesting polar bear. However, Canadians put up their own sign and this, this far to there and every place else at the pole. Gives you a little idea who is claiming what. Notice the dotted red line. That's the 200 mile line from the coast, which every nation in the world has supposed to be able to claim in the ocean from its shore, 200 miles. 
So you get a little feel as to who's claiming what. Now take a look at where Russia is claiming their territory here and here. And they have claimed, of course, the North Pole itself. They want that oil, I guess. Again, a little bit better picture as to where they have done their claiming. <clears throat> Canada also has made a claim of part of it. It's near Greenland and uh, or near, it's part of Canada, just beyond its 200 mile limit. Again, here's some of the territory claims by various nations. The largest amount, of course, is by Russia. But Sweden has claimed a little bit over there, and Norway it is, uh, that is, and Denmark. So Sweden and Denmark, we're here. Gives you a little idea who's claiming what. Now, the Russians decided to build a camp, a camp at the North Pole, okay. The camp is rebuilt every year because it goes away every year during the long and cold winter. The ice sheet, by the way, moves anyway from the North Pole. So it's not always at the same place in the North Pole. And this particular, Barneo has an airport, has hotels, a restaurant, post office, bank, and supermarket. My goodness, all the way up there. And it's there only part of the year and rebuilt again the next year. Hmm. You start out from Valbard. Okay, you get on a plane there and you go up to, the, up to the Russian ice camp. So this is what it does look like if it's got all those facilities that I just re read to you up there. And it's of course very temporary as you can see, these are very temporary buildings and then rebuilt again. It's a 2.5 hour uh, flight from Langeyarbein, Svalbard, to get there. So get your tickets now. Oh, well, I had put this in here. If you're going to build an igloo, why not use the modern way? This is kind of an interesting little story here, where four persons on snowmobiles reached North Pole in 1968. The guy's name is Ralph Flightstead, and he took along a guy by the name of Jerry Pitzel. Jerry Pitzel happened to be in our in the seminary, a seminary, uh, in the um, not the seminary, but the meeting of the many uh, people talking about their experiences when I was at the University of Minnesota. And I was in that group as well. And uh, he was telling us uh, how he joined this group as a geographer on snowmobiles all the way to the North Pole. Well, uh, they took off with a number of snowmobiles. This is Ralph Fleischstedt's. He was an insurance guy and he led the mission to go all the way over there. He didn't die that long ago, 2008. At any rate, Jerry was telling us about, uh, in a seminar, how they were making that trip and the various things that they had to look out for. If you're going to take snowmobiles up there, you have to have plenty of reserve fuel as well as uh, other baggage. So you snowmobile with a sled behind you. And a sled behind you is sort of a uh, insurance thing as well. 
there's one thing that's very important, and that is a quick release of the sled in case you happen to be on very thin ice and you are going down and you want to get out of there, drop the sled, sled down in the water. So uh, not only that, you have to watch out also for other cracks and, and the like that have maybe been covered with the light skin of snow. You can't really always tell where it's at. And uh, one of the things that they do when they sleep there at night or whenever they take a rest or break, uh, they take a husky dog along with them. And the husky dog will not sleep in a tent, sleeps outside under the snow, under some snow, you'll burrow under it as much as possible. But the reason why they keep the dog is the dog is very sensitive to cracks. The crack may occur in the ice, and if you happen to be sleeping in your sleeping bag in, over one of those cracks, it may deposit you down in the water. So they make sure that they have a dog around to warn them of any kinds of cracks. I'm not sure I would like that either. But at any rate, they go on up and they don't get to the North Pole. The first attempt to reach the North Pole in 1967, 10 bombardier uh, skidoos with four persons had to about had to abort 370 mile, nautical miles short of the pole due to a seven day blizzard. That's when I talked to Jerry after that. April 20, 1968, however, the crew with 16 engines arrived all the way 90 degrees north, which was confirmed by the US Air Force. <clears throat> they then reached the North Pole by the way, if you really are in need of a snowmobile, I guess they are still parked up there someplace. So probably long gone. The US weather plane picked them up after a day, after they were confirmed that they actually made that you know, particular trip there. The trip had begun from Hunt Island in Canada and traveled 800 miles except if they had gone in a straight line, it would have been 425 miles. Global warming is an issue, very definitely for these people up there too. And notice in this demonstration, it's, it shows how the um, sun hits the earth. Now, if it hits ice, it bounces a lot more of it back into the atmosphere. Otherwise, uh, there's some that can be absorbed even in the ice, but otherwise uh, the earth does bounce it around and radiates it back into space. Another picture that shows some of this same sort of thing. So if you've got 100% uh, coming into the land itself and the land absorbs about uh, 15, 51%, the rest of it somehow gets bounced back into space. So we can use the solar energy, that's for sure, but we got this problem. Looking at the Arctic Ocean, the yellow line or orange line, whatever it is, is the extent that it occurs to ice up every year and then retreats back to this picture at this point. So uh, this particular one happens to be uh, about 2000. Same thing with this kind of picture. This stuff is 2016. So in September 10. And you get a feel as to how it gradually is getting smaller here in these three pictures. The square miles is getting less and less. And the last one there I have is 2012. So I don't show sure what it is right now. These are also 2012. The top one is, the bottom one is uh, 1984. So see how it has shrunk since then. Uh, here's a 2012 picture of a 
the ice coverage. Another one, this is 2010. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Greenland itself is having trouble. Notice that 1992 is compared to 2002, it's losing its ice cover. It's getting smaller and smaller. Now, it's projected here, if you look at this, these pictures, how clear they are, I'm not sure, but it's supposedly, as you can see, toward the end, it's getting smaller and smaller. We're in 2000, 2090. So it's a long time down the road, but it's projected then to be getting quite a bit smaller. Recently, there was the notation that Verakoyats in Siberia had one of the highest and the lowest temperatures on Earth recorded there. And that is something that happens quite a bit in, in Russia, that you have this wide divergence in temperature between the seasons. It's a vast area of land and that's as a consequence it reacts to the conditions of the sun and the like but this was recorded as a record in uh, december of 2021 so now there are reasons for this change of course all the time and maybe this is just a review for many of you to know that the currents of the oceans have a great deal to do with the Arctic as well. And so the warm currents are uh, established nicely in, uh, around the Gulf and get scooted all the way up to the top, uh, even above Norway. And out in this area, you have Russia's Nurmansk and Archangel, and they usually have a free port, free of, of ice port for most of the year. So because of that warm current, whereas over here, the, that ices up pretty well. And as a consequence, you get all this ice growth in this area, and eventually that leaves on down in this direction. So let's take a look at that. This is the flow. The warm and the cold currents meet, and that's kind of nice if you want to fish. So, uh, if you take a look at the spot where they do meet right in here, you get down into what they call the Grand Banks in this area. We'll see that in a moment. But generally speaking, these are the currents, the currents that occur uh, in the area without ice, but with, with ice underneath, under the ice at least. So there's the uh, various currents that occur in, in the o Arctic Ocean flow on down into the Labrador Current. And when they flow on down, they flow right next to Newfoundland and they form, uh, or they meet the Grand Banks. And the Grand Banks is probably the biggest uh, area that you can find fish, largest area. So, the Grand Banks are right near Newfoundland and it is not totally underneath uh, the area. It's got a good continental shelf to it. So that does help make a good eating place for fish. So the shape of the sea bottom lifts nutrients to the surface, creating food for sea life. The Grand Banks is one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. Cod, haddock, scallop, lobster, and a small forage fish, the, the capelin, furnishes food for the cod. Mixing cold and warm water causes frequent fog in that area, which would be natural. Newfoundland, located on underwater plateaus on the North American continental shelf, ranges from 80 to 350 feet deep. Cold Labrador currents mixes with warm Gulf Stream. Again, 
Notice the bank in this particular place. Uh, the shelf is nicely in this color, and then it drops off very fast around the bank. So if you get in on the bank, so trawlers from around the world love to come here and fish, and that is not necessarily approved by uh, all of C Canadian forces. So they try to limit that if at all possible. Once again, you can see where the shelf is and where they can then, yeah, furnish nutrition for the fish. Good fishing place. Here's a picture, oh uh, yeah. They picked up one of the igloos, huh? I lift, you grab. Was that concept just a little too complex for you, Carl? Okay. All right, quiz time. So we'll get into the quiz. Now, and by the way, if you, I have flu problems. This is one of the way the Irish take care of that. Uh, huh? Okay, well, this one, I don't have the, I, I have the answers to this. I'll zip them through a minute here for you. Number one is dog. Number two is king. Number three is easy. Number four is baker. Number five is how. Six is love. Seven is able. Eight is Jig, nine is George, 10 is Charlie. Did I get any wrong? Not this time? Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. Oh, anytime, any comments you want to make about your experiences in the Arctic? How many have been close to the Arctic? Every once in a while, I have somebody that's been very close to the Arctic. Nobody here, anyway. Whether anybody out in the Zoom land is or not. So. Okay, any questions? You may unmute yourself if you want to make a comment from home. Okay, so if, if there is a comment from the Zoom, why, yeah, it'll come in here, which is good. There's a question over there. Or a statement or whatever you want to make. Well, it's a question. You, you know, you mentioned that um, there's Arctic territorial claims by Russia and Canada and other countries. And earlier you said there's a Las Vegas company, Arctic Oil and Gas, that made claims. I'm just wondering how the Las Vegas company goes and, and tries to extract oil when there's these competing claims by other governments. That's, that's a good question. And I imagine that's part of the fight that goes on between the countries. The Arctic Council is supposed to help with that. Um, and, and actually you're not allowed really to own any property, any territory there, but they do it anyway. So the Arctic Council says that's not to be done, but I guess they can't make the ruling on it either. So now, especially since Russia is going to lead the Arctic Council this coming 13th session. So I'm, that's a good question, whether they can actually get something or not uh, staked out. If you're close, like Alaska is, then you can, of course, use that area on the ice. Yeah. Okay, got another question. Our state. Yeah, you've mentioned several times about global warming, and I'm wondering, as we look at the interest, interest in geography that has waned over the decades to most of our chagrin. <laughs> but you look at global warming, is that created a resurgence and an interest in geography? Because so many things we don't understand. There's a lot of names and ridges yeah. and volcanoes I've never right. heard of yeah. and probably wouldn't. Um, but I think our overall interest in uh, what's happening with global warming is increased our interest in that part of the world. And I think that's really partly what increases our interest in geography. Sure. A lot of us are looking a little bit more closely at the geography 
in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, the borders with Russia, but it's all tied to either your concerns about the great challenges that we face right. or in terms of defense or security that we face. So do you think that this is kind of creating more of a resurgence and in interest in, in geography in and that finding its way back into the schools yes. at the yeah. university level and elsewhere? Yeah, uh, that's uh, not only a good question, it's a good hope on the part of uh, those of us who have studied geography. And uh, as a consequence, the, uh, uh, I don't know, there's been an awful lot of interest in the geography classes that I've been teaching at HASP. Let's see, this is about number 43 or four since I started long ago. And usually when I remember the classes out in the other classroom, um, the classroom held 80 by fire code. Usually 100 would sign up and we always knew that about uh, 20 would not show. So uh, because of this, but uh, they were always filled. They had never, even though the people that came to the classes were experts in their own field, very much so. Uh, doctors and engineers and what have you, they would come to the class to see once what's going on out there. And uh, so I think there's interest in the older generation, but it is a problem though, they have not really incorporated it into a something called a geography class in school. Fortunately, elementary school teachers tend to really emphasize a little bit more of that when they hit the social studies curriculum. That's where it's supposed to be covered. Yeah. Yeah, morning. Yeah, Jerry, it, I'm uh, interested in looking at those pictures you had of the pipeline up by Prudhoe Bay and how many, how much wildlife was walking around the pipeline. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's saying, no, we got to close it down because it, it's detrimental to the animals. They seem to enjoy it. Yeah. It's built high enough so that they can go underneath it, or there are other areas where they can um, kind of like a bridge. So um, most, most of the wildlife can get around up there. If it would spill, that would be another question. And they are very worried about that particular thing. So yeah, uh, supposedly they're supposed to have freedom to walk, the reindeer particularly, they can walk underneath the pipeline. Uh, I recall walking under one of those pipelines and it, it's, it was high enough for uh, cars to go underneath it and, and the like. So, um, and then the other areas where it's laying on the ground that they have to have some place where they can be able to cross that one too. Yeah, yeah, so. So I would share just a little piece of non-scientific trivia. Yeah. Um, we were on a trip in the Canadian maritime provinces a couple of years ago, and our guide was a young woman from Newfoundland. Well, that's how we have all learned to say it, or most of us, Newfoundland. But as a native Newfer, which is what oh, they're called, Newfer. she always pronounced Newfoundland with all three words very really? distinctively very pronounced. Okay. I, and that was fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, so you just never know. Yeah, interesting. That's about like talking about Narlands. You have to New Orleans. It's always Narlands. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thank you for your attention and I appreciate that very much. Well, Jerry, thank you very much for uh, your efforts. All right. Well done. So if you think you can stand it next, next Monday, we'll take a look at Antarctica, which has a lot of human interest in that one. Thank you very much, yeah. everyone, for coming. We'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone at home. I'm going to go ahead and close the class. Have a great day. Oh.
Oh. Just to pronounce 